Our third speaker is Royce Manuel. Royce Manuel is Akmaral Atham, or ri River People, from the Salt River, Pima, Maricopa Indian community in Arizona. He has worked for decades in his community to revitalize the making of traditional tools and objects, including water canteens, agave fiber sandals, burden baskets, and three-hole flutes. He's examining bows and arrows in the Smithsonian collections. Please welcome Royce. Hello, uh, my name is Royce Manuel. I'm from uh, Salt River Indian community. I'm Alkmaard Atham, I'm a river person. I am also a coyote clan related to the red ant. <clears throat> Excuse me, a little bit of family background. Uh, was one of my sons, was my first grandson. Even though a lot of people call me grandpa or great uncle or even great grandpa, that's my truly grandson. Mm -hmm. But I accept all of it. Uh, I have, we have a blended family, me and Debbie. Uh, Debbie Manuel, and she's really uh, a good, break, good help to me because we help collaborate together uh, with the things that we do. Uh, we have a family that sings Navajo songs, so we have a really good identity of who we are as people, and we try to encourage that. I'm from uh, Salt River Indian Community, which is located in the uh, mid part of uh, Arizona. Uh, the arrow is actually pointing to a small area right in the center, almost the center, which is uh, the Salt River Indian community. Gila River is to the south of us, and then Thano Atum, and we also, there's also a small village of Ak Chin. Uh, these, we consider that four sister tribes. We all uh, have the same language, live a different dialects, but basically that's uh, who we are. Our tribe actually extends into Mexico, the sand people near Rocky Point, and also down into... Um, in the Sonoran area, which is the uh, Tuagatam, which is the mountain people. So we actually are, are, are actually tribal official affiliation goes into Mexico. It was, um, next one. Oh, one more of a background is that I was uh, honored with the Spirit of the Herd Award this, this past year because of the work that I do with Agave Fiber and being able to teach. I've done a few classes uh, working with Agave Fiber. The burden basket here, uh, look at on your left, is that, um, actually on your right, the, it's a basket that a man would make, made from agave fiber. Uh, the reason I was awarded was that the, the basket itself hasn't been really been made since, for about 80 years. And so when I put it together, I did it by researching. It took me 15 years to get it all to this point. And finding out that I'm the only one right now in Arizona that makes it. But also recognized through the Native People's Magazine, through the Groundbreakers, uh, because where people were being contemporary in their artwork, I actually took a step back and started doing old, um, old way of doing things, which is um, processing the agave leaf and also to uh, making fiber, making cordage, and then putting something together. Uh, I was also awarded last year one of... Arizona's Indian Living Treasures Award, which is a really good honor for me because I was put in the same category as uh, some of the older people there, and they were actually 20 years older than I am. So uh, to be in that category uh, was a really great honor. Uh, some of the teachings that we plan to, uh, I have planned to do with the workshop is actually understanding what we have here and put them in uh, the autumn words. Hatput for arrow, uusgat for bow, uh, hua is the word for deer, uh, vijana is the word for cordage, ud is the word uh, for uh, agave, and uh, vijana for uh, the cordage. Uh, looking at mentorship that we used to have, because we had roles when we were uh, in the olden days that were the grandfathers and the uncles would teach the younger men that were coming of age. Their responsibility is to recognize the boys changing in his, in his uh, life. When he came of age, you can see the boy's body changed, his shoulders are bigger, his voice is changing. All that, kind of, uh, all that was put together and they said, well, we gotta take this boy out and teach him to be a man. And one of uh, books that was uh, written by Anna Shaw she talks about her brother that came of age and her uncle, his uncle, had uh, given his old shield so he could learn how to die. He had to learn how to protect and also learn his responsibility as a male. 
Uh, some of the materials that I use for the bows is a willow, which is a common. We have a, a river that we're still able to get some. Arrow weeds, it's kind of obvious. Arrow weeds, we make arrows out of arrow weeds. Uh, it, but it's a common uh, plant that grows where there's a lot of water. Obsidian, uh, in a place called Superior, which is just uh, east of us, the, the town of Superior is actually built where there was uh, a lot of obsidian. It's laying on the ground. And so you just go over there and process. But it's also halfway between us and enemy territory. At the time, our, our, uh, our, in history, our enemy was the San Carlos Apaches. So it was actually halfway marked. So we've had a few battles in that area. Uh, but they also call it Apache Tear, the, the obsidian. Uh, the bowstring, uh, this one right here, is made from agave fiber. Like I said, we live in an area where we still have a small segment of our old river, which is called the Verde River. And so this is where I gather some of the materials. Prior to this program that I'm going to be, uh, that I'm, uh, going to be working on, is that I did do a class for the Phoenix Indian Center. We gathered materials that the Navajo would use, which is in uh, Navajo land, the cedar, and we also got um, red willow shoots for the arrows, and we bring it into Mesa, and we had a workshop a uh, week before, and two years ago, a week before Father's Day. So we got fathers and sons together so we could learn how to make bows and arrows. And it was really good because we ended up producing 18 bows and a number of arrows. So it was really good for them because now they work, the children worked along right alongside of their uh, their dads or uncles, and they were able to produce something to go home. I'm gonna go back to that picture. Uh, the, the hands that you see, his name is Freddie Johnson, and him being from the Phoenix Center Center, also being a Navajo, uh, because I was doing the class for them, he actually educated people on the cultural aspect of having to make a bow. So where I showed him how to make a bow in a rough stages and actually produce one, he added all the other information about the bow guard and everything about it and having to grow up and come in of age from his tribe. Like I said, arrow weeds, the feathers. We use uh, turkey feathers, but normally we would uh, use uh, hawk feathers, eagle feathers, owl feathers, and buzzard feathers. So we're able to uh, uh, see some of that in the collections. Uh, bobcat quiver. Uh, this is a good example of a father helping his son. And that's what I want. I, I used this program to project what I wanted to do with this, this new program that I want to come back with to uh, our community. Uh, there's an example of the fiber that I use to make the bowstring out of agave. And down below is the deer sinew. Uh, so I do instruction on how to make this and put this all together. A uh, few samples of my arrowheads that I've been able to make. And I've been making arrowheads for about almost 15 years now. So uh, yeah, I've kind of refined it a little bit more than what it is now but I'm hoping to teach a lot more people. When I was back in the collections in 2011, I, it, I was here for a different program, which is the Gieha, the, the burden basket. But I did have a chance to look at some of the collections and the archives, Is that, uh, and I'm really thankful for that because I was already, I already been working on bows because uh, my dad was given one when he was six years old. He, the first time he met his grandfather, he was six years old, and because he, he was born in 1920, that his grandfather gave him a bow. So I still have that bow. And we actually played with it until 1980. My dad said, you can use it any time you want to, just that don't get the string wet, because the string at the time was made from horse intestines. And so we would make our own arrows and things like that, So, but we finally put it away in 1980. Um, but for me, having to look at the, the older ones, it was really something. Uh, here's one of the uh, community events, and I always have, take any opportunity to teach the young people, uh, particularly boys, that, to shoot uh, the arrows. And then this one is a real good one because uh, if you give a, a child a bow, it only takes them about 10, 10 to 15 shots to figure out the range of it. 
And so it's really a, a good learning process for them. I let them play with it. All of the, the, the bows that I make are made to be shot. It's not made to be put on the wall, so it's not a decorative thing. It's actually a functional bow. And I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to come back here because in this, uh, this time around, I was able to see a number of bows and figure out what kind of materials it was made. But this one in particular is really special because this bow and the information is, that's on it is actually Ira Hayes' bow. And it was, it was for whatever reasons they came into the collections, I'm so grateful to be able to hold it and to see what it looks like and knowing that it's a part of history. If those that don't know who Ira Hayes is, He's on the Iwo Jima uh, statue that's at in uh, Arlington. So you see the last individual that's hold, pushing up the flag, um, but that's who that is, and this is his bow. So that was really amazing for me to find this in the collection. Again, my name is Royce Manuel, and I work with Tools of Yesterday, so uh, that's really my, where I'm at right now. So that's what I want to do is expand more and more on that. Thank you.